that's my favorite uh, Conor McGregor fight. The whole story about it, coming back, showing it, you know, showing how he how he reacts to adversity. It's one one. Would you like to do a third one with uh, with Nate? Maybe at one five five, as you as you mentioned a moment or two ago. It has to be at one five five. Yeah, let's 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 campaign for that. Let's me and you start that campaign. Uh, Connor versus Diaz, part three at one fifty five for the belt. Welcome to What Went Down on BT Sport. I'm Adam Catterall. It's a pleasure once again to be in your company. And today, I am joined by one of the most iconic coaches in the mixed martial arts game, John Kavanagh. And he's here to talk through some iconic moments that he's experienced with Conor McGregor. We're going to go through the lots. John, how are you? I am fantastic. It's a pleasure to be chatting with you. Mate, so it's a great to have you uh, on board. There's lots to talk about. We're going to start in a moment by going all the way back to 178 because, of course, we're preparing for 257. There's a nice little bit of symmetry there. You can see what we've done, can't you, with the opponents. Uh, but first, before we talk fights, uh, let's talk about your relationship with Connor. Let's talk about the first time that you guys met, the conversations that you had, the visions that you that you wrote down, uh, and how that has obviously all, all now played out. What are your first memories from meeting, from meeting Connor? Um, loud, <laughs> aggressive, <laughs> witty, sharp, uh, cocky. So nothing has changed. <laughs> when did you When did you first start having serious conversations about about what has played out? Because I know that obviously he's a good big thinker. He's he's big on obviously planning things out and and working towards them. And I know that you are as well. So when was the first time that you actually sat down and said, right, this is what we're going for? Um, he was always very intense uh, in the lead up to a fight. And this is going back to his almost semi-pro days back in the day, fighting on little shows in Ireland and the UK. Um, but then he would drift. So he was kind of one of those guys in the back of my head. I thought, this guy is incredible, but he's not really focused. And then when he got that first Cage Warriors belt, it almost, you know, he somewhat became a... a I won't go as dramatic as a completely changed man, but I think he saw yeah. that maybe something came out of this. So he started to become more consistent with his training. And then he went on to get the second belt. And then there was a bit up and down about whether he was going to continue or not because the money was still so low. And there just didn't only, only just before he got the second belt, I had, I'd emailed Sean Shelby for the 50th time and I was still getting rejected. And there's only so many times you can ask a girl out and get rejected and keep asking. Um, <laughs> but, uh, he, he had that. Uh, he got the second belt. Joe Rogan gave him a shout out, and then it seemed to be a few days later. All of a sudden, the UFC did have an opening. So um, obviously, that was that going back to January uh, 2013. So you're going actually eight eight years ago. This month was when he got that first offer for April 1st. It was actually April Fool's Day, I think. So that even made me more think. Somebody's had the hack in the UFC uh, email here and they're winding me up. Um, but there you go. Eight years ago, we got obviously very, very serious. Um, we've been very blessed and we've trained hard and he's, he's obviously competed very well. And it's all led to this moment, this conversation you and I are having. Absolutely. It doesn't get the, bigger. It's, than this conversation, of course. The... Uh, the um... The journey's been littered with iconic moments all the way. You just mentioned the debut there in Sweden, right? Because, of course, it's fantastic in the octagon. But then, I think where a lot of fans and maybe the momentum started was things that he was saying on the microphone. And obviously, him asking for that bonus to Dana on the microphone afterwards, after that debut. It kind of then starts that momentum, doesn't it? Like you said, the Cage Warriors thing, anybody in Europe and Ireland, they, they already knew kind of what Connor was doing. But then to come and do it in the Champions League of this sport, in the UFC, and to do it the way that he's doing, then starts that momentum. Uh, yeah, it, it, it started when we when we were flying out there. Um, there's actually that, I'm sure you know, there was a funny story where we had to stop off in the post office on the way out there for him to collect the social welfare. Um, and then, you know, he gets that bonus. And then when we fly back, we're coming back to people stopping us in the airport. And that's the first time we ever got stopped for a, you know, a picture, um, a, a chat, a congratulatory uh, message. And 
you know, I always said one of the moments for me, one of the big moments for me was in the lead up to the Mendes fight. And I was in a shop and a woman in clearly in her 60s asked me, was Connor working on his takedown defense? And I said, this something's about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> this is unusual. <laughs> He's at the hitting a nerve of the Irish people. May unbelievable. We'll get to Mendes in a minute, right? Because let's you? go to 178. I know there were... I know that was yeah, very nice that. I know that there was fights obviously in between that debut to, to where we're at right now, and there's a little bit of time out with injury and what have you. But one seven eight and the first fight with Dustin felt like the coming out party, the real arrival. People were talking about him, the momentum was going, but from obviously it's a, it's a Las Vegas debut as well, you know. So I think yes. I think that kind of it kind of just blew from there, and obviously the performance. Talk us through your thoughts, feelings. I mean, like I said, it's a Vegas debut, so I'm sure that there were nerves, if there is ever nerves around a comic Look at that cap on backwards. What talk is a disgraceful look for me? What the hell was I thinking? <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> I, I just don't have a head for caps, and we, we learned that in that fight there. Um, but yeah, the, 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 I just thought, you know, it's his first fight. We're going to take a while to build up a following in America. And at the weigh-ins, it was nuts. And at the fight, it was deafening the Irish fans and, and American fans. And we really knew, you know, this is not normal. This this cannot be ordinary. It had the main event feel to it. Everybody, the stadium was packed for it. Um, and it was facing a really, you know, a very talented up-and-coming fighter himself at the time. Dustin was was being talked about for, for title fights, etc. That kick should have been two inches lower and we would have went home early. <laughs> the emotional investment that maybe Dustin had put into that fight, did you believe in the changing room before the fight kicked off that the fight was already won because of how Conor had acted throughout the course of the week? Um, not because of how he acted during the week, but how training, that's, that's always going to be the indicator um it wasn't his first time fighting in the ufc so we already knew he was of that caliber you know the first time you're in the ufc you're always wondering you know do these guys not put their trousers on one leg at a time like other humans um but he'd been in there he'd beaten guys we had been sparring with guys that were at this level so we knew he had the physical ability to do what he went ahead and done to do it in, in that type of fashion even even that was surprising to us and um, here you go. That's all she wrote. As Joe Rogan said, well. as Joe Rogan said, he is the real deal and he did make it look easy. What's the conversation like in the changing room after that fight? Um, where is the after party? <laughs> <laughs> there the must, no, the must be cool. a period the though time, where you stop. It was the yeah. first time meeting um, Uncle Frank, uh, as, as Connor calls him. Um, he always brought a nice bottle of whiskey into the uh, the change rooms, and that that tradition began on that night. Um, so right away it was talk of, which is always with Connor, it's talk of not necessarily who is next, but when is next. There's Lorenzo standing up in the background with his August McGregor suit on. Well, I guess it was just my August suit back then, and there he is getting his new brown belt. Um, and again, yeah, fantastic, fantastic experience. Well, on, you, you mentioned there the Irish fans. Debut in Vegas, did it take your breath away, the amount of people that started travelling overseas to come and watch you guys do your thing? Yeah, um, I don't know if you will remember any of the madness around the World Cup, uh, the Irish, uh, when we had Jack Charlton yeah. leading Ireland into the yeah. World Cup. And, there, you know, there's been books written yeah. about that and we have movies... Um, Roddy Doll movies back home and the snapper and stuff like this and to try and capture the mania around Ireland in the nineties around football. And I remember the, in the, the week uh, of the fight and there was like, you'd see, we were getting sent these video clips of, of the MGM being like packed and, you know, hundreds of fans on the stairs, all singing songs and, I just couldn't believe I send it back to my dad and I was like, I can't believe I'm now part of something that hasn't been in Ireland since the early 90s with the World Cup fever. And to be somewhat the cause of that, you know, in, 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 a, in a six degrees of a connection type way um, was just weird. You know, it was just weird. I'm, I'm a 
kind of a quiet introverted guy and my dad is even more quiet and more introverted than me so really not used to that world at all so to be as we say in Dublin thrown into the middle of that was um it was, it was just something weird just something special listen it was only getting bigger as well man you know they just started with the with the dusting fight because we went on this run then um at featherweight to the, the, the run to the championship, of course. And there were a couple of bumps along the way. There were fights that were booked, there were fights that fell off. Um, but if I may, we'll start with Siva. We'll go into Mendez and then we'll go to Aldo. All right, so we'll give a little, we'll play some footage for you now and give you a little bit of a run of that. Talk to you about the Siva fight because he was devastating on this particular night. Uh, and I think maybe the fight itself from a fan's point of view has kind of been forgotten a little bit. It's what happened afterwards in jumping the cage and obviously confronting Jose. But from a technical point of view, how do you, how do you look back the Dennis Siever yeah, fight. you've got to remember, um, Siever at the time was known as this devastating striker. He had one of the best turning sidekicks in the UFC. Um, he has his own great finishes. And I think people thought, okay, let's let's see just how good a striker Connor is. Because Siever, if you remember, was, you know, as you, as you can see, he's built like a freaking tank, an absolute block. And I'm sure a lot of people were questioning whether or not he'd be able to hurt him, considering his clear... Uh, strength his power his muscle um, mm. and and what and he did very in a very one-sided fashion and then uh that jump outside the cage there confronting aldo he just he he, uh, he he made it impossible for that fight not to happen at that stage he really grabbed the moment by the throat and insisted on it well we're, we're about to see the walkout but before we play it um, it was made, the Aldo fight was made. And again, another iconic moment. And I think this is a, a moment where a lot of fans, if they didn't love him by this point, they most certainly loved him coming into this fight with Chad Mendes because Aldo's butts, Aldo falls off. And there's a moment, I think he's on UFC embedded, the camera's in his face. Right, I'm going back to bed. Give me a shout when you've got yourself a new opponent and I'll, I'll, I'll see you another time. You know what I mean? And I think everybody were like, Wait, is this, guy, this guy's a lunatic. There's only, there's only five <laughs> days or something remaining for the fight. What's he doing? But that, yeah. again, and then he turns, turns up fight night and puts in an, a sensational performance. And I know that there's a moment in this fight as well. You're on the cage, both of you, at the end, right? Look at that. The chat in there. Oh, man. There's a moment at the end where you two are having a little bit of a chat and I think... I haven't had this confirmed. Hopefully you can confirm this. It's when he escapes the guillotine. Is that what you're talking to him about? <laughs> I was like, the heartbreaker. The heartbreaker. I called it the heartbreaker. Uh, it was a technique that, uh, look there, beautiful. Uh, he broke my heart with that technique because when I was a little bit able to give him more competitive jiu-jitsu rolls, that would be a technique I would catch him with, the guillotine. I'm a pretty decent guillotine myself. And then he was able, he, he learned how to counter it. And I wasn't able to get him anymore. And my heart was broken. So I call it the heartbreaker. But um, I will take my heart being broken for it to give him... Um, <laughs> for It was one of those turning points in the fight that I'm sure Mendes, he looks like he has a mean guillotine. I'm sure in the gym, he, got, he finishes people all the time with it. And um, yeah, sometimes when you're, when you're in a fight and you're tired and you hit your best move and then the guy gets out of it, 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 really, just, it really just finishes you off. So um, when he escaped that guillotine, I think there's a synchronized footage. The camera's on me and you can see a kind of an ear to ear grin where I'm very happy to see that. <laughs> Joe, what's your mentality like when he takes a fight like that on that short amount of notice? I mean, you've done the work in the gym. You've been preparing for the world title fight against Jose Aldo, you know, maybe preparing I don't know, for leg kicks and various things like that. Chad Mendes is a very different opponent. So what goes through your mind at, at short notice fights like that? We've always tried to, um, I'm from a, uh, from an SPG background, which is from a JKD, um, lineage, you know, Bruce Lee and there is no opponent and that we should be ready for all styles of opponents at all times. So we've always tried to keep our training 90% general and 10%, uh, opponent specific, and you're not going to get a much greater change of style going from Aldo to Mendes. And the fact he was so confident in his training to be able to accept that on what I believe was about a week's notice, if I remember correctly, mm. um, is a real testament to that mentality and that training. And I've always said that, I've always been able to use that example with my next wave of fighters, telling them, don't get too obsessed with 
watching your potential opponent all the time because you could be five days out and I might be walking into your bedroom saying, sorry to wake you early, champ, just a heads up. It's going to be 10 days now. And for him to shrug his shoulders and turn over and say they're all the same, you better have that same attitude. I don't want to hear any moaning, any complaining. Just be ready for whoever it is. So that's the way he talked and that's the way he walked. He proved it on the night. Mm. Again, we then move on to this one, but you can see Jose there. Let's roll it uh, because it doesn't last that long. We've seen so many countless pieces of footage, whether they're in the changing room or the night before walking the walk. It seemed like this. I know that they, obviously the, the phrase is there now, Mystic Mac. He predicts what's going to happen. But it was like he was convinced that Jose was going to rush him. He was going to step back and pop him with that left hand. And that's that's what we got. We got 13 seconds of of probably one of the most iconic fights in UFC history. Yeah, he had um, numerous times in the... I, I think the vision started becoming very, very clear of fight week. He'd said it a little bit in the lead up, but... But certainly in fight week, it became a, a almost constant conversation of a very clear vision he had of um, Aldo overextending himself and leaving himself open for one of Connor's best shots, which is that kind of fade back uh, uh, left cross. And, um, and sure enough, the <laughs> Mystic Max strikes again. What's the feeling like? when that plays out the way that it plays out. The, the, all the work that you've done, you mentioned Cage Warriors, the journey, the Cage Warriors, the moment now. What's that like? I don't really tend to get massively excited by anything and I don't get massively down by anything. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's just over. And, uh, you know, we, we, had, we had fun that evening. And I know I'm in the gym next week. And I actually remember after that fight, uh, when I got home, um, literally my first day in the gym tile was blocked and I was in clearing it <laughs> and <laughs> crash back down to earth job there you go son I had a photo with me with a, with a plunger and I was saying like you know this time last week I was on top of the world and uh, breaking records in Vegas and now I'm on I'm unblocking the toilet in, uh, in SPG so it, it, that keeps you humble <laughs> Indeed it does, mate. Indeed it does. Um, we then try to do something that nobody has ever done before and become a simultaneous uh, dual weight world champion in the UFC. Obviously, that's one belt done, one, four, five, ticked off. Um, the aim was one, five, five. And of course, the fight with uh, Rafael Dos Anjos was booked uh, for one, nine, six. He then gets injured. And again, it's that short notice. You've just been speaking about the short notice uh, mentality, the attitude and what have you. The Nate Diaz thing then comes up. And okay, the, the opponent's changed, but the weight changes as well. What's going through your mind now? Has it changed at all with, with, with the weight going up to welterweight? You know, at that stage, I've got to be honest and say, I was, I was a bit caught up in the mania of it all. I just thought this, this man walks on water. Um, there's a part of you that acknowledges that Nate at that stage had really only been stopped once with a a really bad head kick that he had dipped into. But beyond that, mm. no one had even barely, you know, had barely rocked him. And he'd had a lot of tough fights. So it flashes across your mind, well, this could, this, this, you know, this guy is not easy to put away. We got to be ready for a long, tough fight. But then the other part of you has been, uh, you just look at this guy that seems to just drop everybody with a, with a blink of his eye. So, um, and Nate is, you know, uh, he comes forward so much that there's going to be a lot of opportunities. He'll walk into that left hand, we'll, we'll, we'll brush our hands and we'll, we'll be back, uh, back out again, back to Uncle Frank in the changing rooms and a, and a, and a 21 year old whiskey. Um, and then that was not the case. We, we, we learned a valuable lesson in that fight. We learned about, you know, respecting the extra poundage, you know, from 145 mm -hmm briefly to 55 and then all the way up to 170 and it is different fighting 145ers and fighting 170 guys and learned about style you know you're going against somebody that you've got to appreciate they're probably going to be there for 25 minutes so let's learn about pacing so a lot a lot of great lessons you know it was it was kind of the on the back of that i, I wrote win or learn because it was uh it, it really it really did um it really did show our philosophy 
of that we want to either be winning or we want to be learning. And I think that's Connor's greatest attribute that less than four months later, he went in against the same guy at the same weight class and, and, and showed that with making those adjustments, he was able to get a great win. I think one of the things that I was most impressed with off, off the back of that, you suffer loss. And anybody can do anything in victory, can't they? I mean, there's that famous saying um, where anybody can do anything in victory, but it's only in defeat that a, a man really shows himself. And I think we were all, as media members, we were all sat there going, what's Conor going to say? You know, we've seen him rock the mic. We've seen him say this, that and the other and set us all on fire, dancing into the week and dancing into the night. What's he going to say off the back of a defeat like this? And I thought that he was... I thought that he was absolutely magnificent. The way, that, the way that he dealt with that, the way that he fronted it, the way that he spoke about it, the way that he gave respect. And like you've just said there, going into the second fight and then going, we're not changing the weight. We're not going to bring the advantages back to me. I'm going back. We're going to go back to welterweight and we're going to go and get the job done. Yeah, for me as his, as his kind of, you know, uh, for me as his long-term coach, I was so proud that I remember some people come in to the locker room after the defeat and said, um, you know, look, we're not expecting you really to do the media. Let's, we'll kind of take you out the back and we'll go back to the hotel. And he was like, no, what are you talking about? Of course I'm going to go out and do the media. Um, you've got to be able to do both. And the fact that all he spoke about was, you know, personal responsibility, um, being accountable for uh, his own actions, you know, not pointing fingers, not looking to blame anybody else, took it on the chin and, um and like you said, I certainly was pushing for the rematch to be at 155. I was even pushing for it to let leave Nate alone for a while. That guy is a monster. <laughs> and he was, he was having none of it. Had to be at the same weight class. Had to be the same opponent. And had to be quick. You know, barely gets time to recover. You know, it, any fight is traumatic. So you have to take some time to recover and then get back in the gym. And it was all, all of that was done in... I think it was tw uh, maybe twelve, uh, maybe fourteen weeks or something like that. I can't remember exactly, but quite quite soon anyway. And um, yeah. just you know, I've had so much. I already had respect from, but I, it, that was a whole new level of respect. It was a real. And when I got home, I, you know, I have a commercial MMA gym. I've got kids classes, women's classes, and so on. And I never got so many messages from from mothers. You know, that some of them would write and say, "Oh, I wasn't always that enamored by Connor, and you know, I didn't really want my eight-year-old son." looking up to him, but that uh, he's, he's really shown a different side to him there. And I'm, we're so proud to have our child in the same gym as him. The performance, you're seeing it obviously right now, we're, we're witnessing you talking him through this 25 minutes where I think every Conor McGregor fan's heart's pumping through their chest. A very different performance. It felt like a thinking man's performance. Not that he's not always thinking, I know he's always thinking, but it felt like he was absolutely super on it when it came to thinking through his work of that 25 minutes. Yeah, like we talked about earlier, it was a real, um, a real study in efficiency. It was, it's, you know, it was a, it sounds silly to say, but it was real martial arts. You know, we had to make sure that we did everything right every minute. There couldn't be any, there couldn't be any second of that 25 minutes where you were able to switch off, pay act, look around, None of that. It was 25 minutes of, of elite performance. And, um, you know, he did, he did, I, I, that's my favorite uh, Conor McGregor fight. The whole story about it, coming back, showing it, you know, showing how he, how he reacts to adversity. Um, as Fedor once said, um, it's, it's not about getting knocked down, it's about standing back up again, you know. And, and it's only those who stand up that can be knocked down. So, there's just, there's just a lot of life lessons. You know, I, I, I do a lot of visiting um, uh, schools back home. You know, I like going around to schools and talking to kids about goal setting and motivation and, and uh, dealing with losses, you know, dealing with failures and, and always, t always um, aiming to use your losses uh, to improve and failing our way up towards success, which is what Connor's done, rather than failing your way down to quitting, which is what's common. So to have stories like this to be able to use, uh, very powerful anecdotes like that, which really, you know, get kids pumped up, is um, it's kind of what it's all about. It's what for me, it's what professional sports is about. What is the point of it? It should be to inspire people, to give people a bit of strength, um, that you can look up to uh, heroes, so to speak. Couldn't have said it better myself, man. Nailed it. The um, 
we've, we've heard a lot about part three. It's 1-1. One, one. Would you like to do a third one with uh, with Nate? And maybe at 155, as you as you mentioned a moment or two ago? I, it has to be at 155. <laughs> I've already I'm already heard Connor say in an interview that it'd be 170 again. Um, I think there's maybe five hairs left that are not grey that he wants to make sure are snow white. Um, but what would it be? Would it not be a great story if it was that for the 155 oh. belt? Um, I think that'd be a great story. Um, yeah, let's 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 campaign for that. Let's me and you start that campaign. Uh, Connor versus Diaz, part three at 155 for the belt. Perfect. Sounds good to me, man. Um, now, you've just said part two with Diaz is your favourite Connor fight, Connor performance, all right? The next one's my favourite, and it's not because he becomes champ champ, even though it, it does obviously hold some credence there to be the first dual weight uh, world champion. I just think it's art. This is punch perfect. The Eddie Alvarez fight from start to finish. And as well, it, it was an iconic night because let's not forget, the UFC, mixed martial arts, have been campaigning for a long time to get into New York. Madison Square Garden, a sensational arena. Loads of history there. And for him to go and do that on that particular night with all that pressure on him, I just think this is the best Conor McGregor performance to date. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you in terms of it being a perfect fight. It's a beautiful fight. Um, I guess the Diaz 2 is special to me because of the bigger story, you know, coming uh, yeah. coming back from an emergency, coming back from a loss. And I just love that I, ha I can I can extract so many good stories from from that journey to to pass on to the to the kids in our gym, to the fighters in my gym. Um, you know, like I said, when I'm when I'm doing talks. But it, yes, like I said, it, this was the art in martial arts. It was a a. a there's not a whole lot in this fight that you would not uh, correct if you could redo it. Um, look at that 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 understanding of range there. There's no there's no striking coach that doesn't watch this fight uh, salivating. That he can um, he can stand at a position where he knows that Eddie's punch was bending a hair on the end of his nose, but that's as far as he could reach. Whereas you know when Connor True, he was always in a position that he was punching through the target. So. Good, beautiful, beautiful fight to watch. Right, I want to talk to you about this 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 whole week, right? Because it's just littered with iconic moments. I, people have let, obviously had murals made of it. That people got paintings and posters all over the houses, all over the world of stuff that happened this week. Okay, how much of this, right? Do you guys or Connor with with someone do, does he sit down and go, right? This is what I'm going to do this week, right? For press conferences, I'm going to turn up in a notorious B.I.G. jumper. I'm going to turn up ro rocking the old Gucci mink like Joe Frazier back in the day. I'm going to turn up a little bit late. Then I'm going to go and do this unbelievable speech where he's apologising to absolutely nobody. Come on, man. Is this all just like, we're just going to do it? Or is there a moment where you'll sit down and say, this will be funny. Let's do this. <laughs> there is zero planning. I, I, when, I, when I speak to American journalists... Um, I think they get it a lot less than Irish and British journalists do because you remember that witty kid at the back of the classroom that just had the one liner for the teacher that would just kind of have you yeah. in tears laughing the whole time. And I think there's something somewhat unique about the, about Ireland and, and the UK that we have this kind of somewhat dark, sarcastic humor. We're able to, you know, <laughs> kind of take the piss out of each other really, really well. And it's just one of those moments that makes up Connor as this perfect storm that he would have been amazing with just his fight skills. He would have been, he would have been, you know, if you look at someone like um, Chael Sonnen, he's amazing with his lines. He would have been amazing with just the lines. Um, you know, just again and again and again, he just seems to have all these, uh, factors that any one of them individually is rare and he's got 10 of them it's it's just a it's a once in a generation athlete and it's it, you know i'm just very honored and very humbled to be uh part of his team to be part of the training of him um but yeah there is zero i i've, I've actually have asked him uh, myself a similar question i've i have said to him come on did you you must have thought about that one a little bit and even even the Joe Frazier jacket, I remember he showed up with the price tag still on it because 
he had a just <laughs> hey on the way to the press conference decided to go and buy that you know didn't even think about taking it off when he when he arrived so there's a lot of last minute stuff there that he just seems to have a a surreal sense of how to make a moment iconic it's the entertainment business man and he's at it absolutely right at it so new york madison square garden champ champ done something that nobody else has done before we seen people do it obviously since but connor was connor was the first Clock the game. Then we go into the world of boxing. We have a little bit of a dabble in there with the TBE, the guy that is undefeated in the world of boxing, the guy that makes all the money out in the world of boxing. Talk to me through your conversations with him at that time and your thought process of him stepping away from the octagon and having a little bit of a dabble in the boxing ring. You know, it's it's kind of, why not? You know, well, we're, we're, we're all going to be, we're all going to be older men at some stage i'm going to be sitting around my son reminiscing and looking maybe at this interview even in the next decade or two decades with him and it was just another great um story for that book um he'd, he'd achieved so much in mma and why not have a go at the at the tbe you know um I just felt it was going to be just a, a wonderful journey it was a great learning experience for me it was a great learning experience for us all we took a lot from that, um, even to bring back to the MMA world. Um, yeah, just a great, another great chapter. Do you think he's done with boxing? Because he keeps he keeps mentioning Manny, doesn't he? He keeps mentioning that he'll have a little bit of a go. Yeah, I, I'd be I'd be surprised if he doesn't box again. Um, but I won't lie, I'll be a little bit jealous. <laughs> I would, if it's my choice, he's, he's doing MMA. <laughs> no, absolutely. The, um, obviously, this then, off the back of Mayweather, we lead into Habib, okay? And I think in my conversation with um, Connor last year, just before Donald, we spoke about the things that have happened outside the Octagon, the incident in Brooklyn and various things like that. And some of the stuff that we touched upon is, not having mixed martial arts as prominent in his life that then leads to, I don't know if disarray is the right word, but, but, but I'll use it, disarray outside in, in, in his normal everyday life. Did you see that as a friend, as a confidant? Did you say, listen, he, he, this is the thing that has got you to X, Y, and Z and has obviously given you balance in your life. It's no longer there anymore. And this is what is causing all these other things. Um. You know, there's there's private conversations there. It's I I he's he's talked about this himself that he wasn't as um, focused during that period. He he lost himself a little bit. You know, even from myself, like I I'm I'm obviously um, I love being part of training him, but I do have fifty other fighters and I have a busy gym and I've got my own life. So you know, when if he's not in the gym, I, he's not really on my mind. I'm I'm busy of trying to improve myself as a coach and I'm I'm getting James Gallagher ready I'm getting um you know list off list off all the guys that I'm dealing with on a daily and yeah. a weekly basis um so yeah you know that period of his life was what it was and and um he he got through it if you I I said if you're if you're going through hell you keep going you don't stop because heaven is just on the other side and I feel we're, we're we've gone through hell he's gone through hell and now we're on the rise, and that's where his mindset is. That's where my mindset is. It's in a very positive, um, happy place. And this is, we had a start on uh, my birthday last year, January 18th, and here we are again, uh, all, not far off my birthday, January 23rd. He seems to fight either on my birthday or very close to my birthday a few times. The Seaver fight was on my birthday. Um, so, uh, yeah, here we go again. And um, ne what's next is... A, it's not who that's important. It's when that's important. And I hope the UFC mm. give us a soon when. No, yeah, absolutely. Just just referring back to the actual fight now with uh, with Habib, building up to it with um, with training and various things like that. Did you notice that it it was slightly different at all in any way, whether it comes to mental preparation, physical preparation for the contest? Yeah. Um, Here's the Billy Walk. Um, you know, he has said himself he was not he was not his usual focus self um, that you know that we're seeing now. That's for sure. Um, if I'm being a hundred percent honest as well, like I like 
I love MMA and the sport. Uh, I love martial arts. I I didn't really I didn't enjoy the build up to this at all. It was it was it was it was particularly um, nasty, you know, whatever word you want to use. Um, and I got kind of pulled asunder because I said the 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 build up for this fight was all about kind of revenge and anger and hate compared to the build up for the Cerrone fight, which was about love. <laughs> so we're back to uh, we're back to training for the love of it, competing for the love of it, and it's a much better place to be. I think you kind of touched upon it before, John. You know, you've got to go through certain things, experience certain things, maybe make some mistakes, do things wrong in life, not just necessarily in fighting, yeah. in order to in order to learn, in order to grow. You know, and I think, like you've just said, nobody coming away from the the Habib fighting situation comes away with it and and enjoys it because obviously everything that happens after the fight as well, they look back at it and then they compare that to where. Connor was, for example, in the build-up to the Donald fight, and you think, there's obviously learns there. And I think that's all we can do as human beings, isn't it? We make mistakes, we learn from those things, and we move forward. Well, again, you know, if we, if we want to talk about what is the point of professional sports, I think that's what it is. It gives people, um, these, these guys are superhumans, and it gives us mortals something to, to look at. And... The, like you said, everybody's great in victory. Everybody's everybody's great at winning. Not so many are good at losing. And, mm. um, you know, there's just a lot of little kind of stories and anecdotes and, 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 and lessons you can pull from that that I use to pass on to, the, to, the, to our junior members in their gym. Like I said earlier, when I'm going doing these talks. And, um, you know, if Connor's ended that night, I think it would have been a, a terrible... Um, overshadow on his career in general but it didn't it didn't end that night he went through it he came out the other side and and here we are he's, he's coming off a fantastic victory over a great opponent in Cerrone and now he's getting ready for another great opponent in um, in Dustin mm. what, did, what was going through your mind because Habib literally goes over the top of your head there into the crowd, doesn't he? What was going through your mind at that time? And there's a little clip of you rushing into the octagon to defend Connor and to obviously to break up the scurries that are in there. Yeah, what went through my mind was duck. Yeah, look, I'm um, I'm also back home. I'm the president of the um, the Amateur Mixed Martial Arts Association. Um, it's my goal. It's my dream to get my sport recognised by the Irish government, by by Air Air Body Sport Ireland. I would love for the kids coming up to be able to represent their country with pride and go to the you know IMAF or International Federation. They put on these fantastic world championships, and I'd love for them to be able to go away compete the way our, our national amateur boxing team does and our national amateur badminton team does. All of our sports, and I want the MMA to be the same as all of them. To have no to be no different. It's just a sport at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, to have dark moments like this, to be so public and, you know, to be vilified by the press and whatnot, um, it, it, it makes everything take a few steps back. So it's, it's, it's disappointing, to say the least. And, you know, it's just you, just don't, you just don't want that to be part of our game. Um, fair enough, there was a a very emotional build up to this, but then it was over, you know, and, and Habib had won and, you know, congratulations, shake the hands that you're, you're a better man on that particular night. Um, things spilled over and, and what happened happened. It's in the past now. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it doesn't have that feel to it this time. Did you feel that that might be it for Connor in the octagon? Do you think he called time? Um, I I might have had that thought if if I hadn't seen how he reacted to the Diaz one, you know it wasn't his first time losing. He's got a couple of losses on his career. Um, early on, when he lost, he disappeared. You know he put his head he put his head down and he just he just avoided everybody and ran away and 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 hid from it. And then you look at how he evolved as an athlete and matured as a man. 
And with the Diaz loss, he he put a suit on. He stood tall. He stood in front of you guys, and he he talked about where he was and what he's going to do and how he'll improve. And sure enough, he came back and did that. And um, maybe there's a small side of me that would have been uh, – I'll be careful how I word this, but I knew that that loss was, was going to change him in a positive way, that maybe a win there, mm. I would have lost him altogether because he was already kind of losing focus somewhat on the type of training he would normally do. And if you went in and beat him with that type of mindset, he might have believed he's a absolute superhero that doesn't need to do, that doesn't need to put the kind of sacrifice and hard training in that he has done since he has done for Cerrone and he's done now for Dustin. So, hmm. you know, with, with all of these things in life that we all go through, if where you are right now is a good place, well then can we really call anything in the past bad? Because we don't know what those moments did, what what way they bumped us onto certain pathways. That if we're, where we are right now is very good, maybe that perceived bad moment was the best moment of our life because it led to where we are now. And I look at Connor now, and he seems to be so happy in himself and very relaxed and loving his time with his family and his two kids and number three on the way now. And um, who, who the hell knows where he would have been if, if different areas in his life had it went different ways. So I look at that back. I look back at that moment now in a positive way. No, absolutely. I've, let's look back to last year then, January, because he's fighting Donald, and I've got to. I've got to admit, I don't normally get nervous before. Uh, interviewing anybody but because of the narrative off the back of Habib and Conor being out of the octagon for such a long period of time I didn't know where his head was at I didn't know where he was going to be at because as you just said being around the Habib fight week it was a very different fight week to normal Conor fight weeks so to see him in Vegas last year against Donald centred focused calm and I think you've touched upon something there which is massive and I think it was massive in my life I'm sure it's massive in your life as well John becoming a dad that, you know what I mean? Especially becoming a dad to a girl as well, you know what I mean? I think I think that helped in some way to bring him back round to a point where it was a joy to be in his company last year. Look how big Cerrone looks in that. Jesus. I know, man. Jeez. I remember I glanced up at the screen at that moment and I noticed and I was like, whoa, that guy put the weight back on. He's, he's a big lump of a human. And then, Talk us through it. Shoulder. It's only the last 40 seconds. The shoulder bumps, yeah. I know. Beautiful, beautiful shots there that he'd done. He'd actually done in previous fights, maybe not as obvious as that, and certainly had done it a lot in training. But um, it was incredible to see uh, the effect they had. Uh, really, you know, you kind of knew what way the fight was going already. And then, yeah, there you go. Look at that. 40 seconds to put away somebody who has had incredible wins himself, who's had incredible battles himself. It's um, almost unbelievable. Who also went on to have two fights after that, last year, and put in some stellar performances, did, did Donald. So I think that just kind of rubber stamps the magnitude of what Connor did that night to a man like Donald. Yes. Yeah, it really does. And it's it's funny because, you know, once Connor beats somebody, it's always, <laughs> it's always that... Uh, group of people who were like, ah, oh, well, that guy, he was, he was done anyway, and he was never that good anyway. <laughs> um, and then, like you said, he went on to, he's, he's still going on, he's still, he, Donald seems to fight every month. <laughs> so uh, he was he was legitimate, very, uh, a very tough opponent, and um, to do it in that way was pretty special. I'll, I'll speak to Connor about this in the week as we build up towards UFC 257. But when I spoke to him last January, it was about the season. He was focused, lasered in, like I said, in a really good headspace, obviously going through Donald, then the next one, then the next one. He wanted activity. Activity was the word that he was using all the time with me. And obviously the pandemic hits, that kind of kiboshes a lot of things. You know, it changes everybody's world. But one of the things when you look at back at 2020 for the majority of people, the year wasn't that good. But if you look at back at 2020 for Conor McGregor, it was really good. It was a really good year, man. I mean, he's, done, he's, he's had a stellar performance in the octagon. And then he came through as this political leader <laughs> at, at, at some point <laughs> where he, where, where he was, you know, 
where the world was cr crying out for, we want political leaders, we want people to help us out. And Connor obviously stepped forward with that. You just mentioned, obviously, you got engaged, pregnancy. 2020 was a good year for, for Connor. Yeah, for sure. And um, I don't know if I would use the term political leader, but he certainly took leadership. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to slate him with that, uh, with that term. Um, but yeah, you know, again, just just I, I'm I was oozing pride at how at how much he wanted to and did involve himself, and some stuff was 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 known about and quite public, you know, the million euro donation and, and PPE and 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 almost yeah. it's almost comedy that he went around driving a truck delivering it himself, and that there were some very shocked faces of uh, you know people receiving packages and it's. You look a lot like that guy, Connor. Yeah, I am that guy, Connor. <laughs> um, and some stuff that's still not known about that he was doing in the background. So yeah, just just very very proud. And as he has said himself, in, in his recent interview, is that he he recognizes and accepts that his role really is to help up those who who are not quite as fortunate as him, and he takes that mm. seriously. He stands. He's a role model to a lot of people, and I remember in his early twenties when he was told that, uh, well, maybe mid twenties, and he would get not angry but frustrated being told that. Listen, you're a role model, and you got to carry yourself. And, and he'd he'd shook it off and say, "That's not my business. I just look after me." And and now he's very accepting of that title and that responsibility. That it's not just about you anymore, and that's on a micro level that's the fan on a macro level, he has to accept he's influencing millions and millions of, of young people around the world and he he's you can see he's he's doing his best to lead by example he is he is but man anybody can he can have his his, his ups and his downs and his faults like us all um but he's doing his best and that's all you can ask of anybody and as his coach now leading into 2021 and UFC 257 with the Dustin uh, rematch. How exciting is that for you to have a fully focused Conor McGregor with the fire in his heart again, a little bit of ambition in his belly once again? Because we all know, he doesn't have to be here. The guy's a wealthy guy. He's done extremely well. He's here purely for competition and ambition of achieving something. So how much does that then get your fires going? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm his coach, but I, I'd be lying if I didn't say I'm probably his his number one fan too. Um, it's always just such a joy. By the time we walk out, the the work is done, and I just get, I just happen to have the best seat in the house, and it's just, you know, it's just watch and enjoy. Um, and it, like he said about his ambition and his motivation, well, what is it? And I've said this in other interviews that if his ambition and motivation was to fight for money, which is f fair enough, that's that's been a lot of MMA fighters' goal is to get wealthy, to be free of any financial worries. And as soon as they achieve that, they retire. And that's, you know, more power to them. But that's clearly not what Connor's goal was then. It was a nice side effect. It was a nice side benefit of all he's achieved, but it was never his motivation or his goal. The motivation or goal was to be the best version of himself. And I think he had to go through a lot to really understand that. And he's come out the other side of it, getting that, that that's what the dream, that's what the goal is. That's what he's trying to achieve. And he said in an interview there recently that he believes he's at 50%, which is terrifying. <laughs> if he's at 50% capacity, what the hell are we going to be dealing with this time next year when he's racing towards 100%? So it's very, very exciting time. Um, I just, like I said, I hope the UFC have a very quick win. I don't care who, just give me when. Two more things then. What's it like being stood in the tunnel, foggy dew plays, and you get to walk out? It's it's funny because um, that song, um, uh, the Foggy Jew, and um, his walkout tune. I never remember the name of it. What's it called? Do you know? Notorious B.I.G. Yeah, hypnotize. Yeah. Oh, hypnotize. Yeah, yeah. And 
I, no matter where I am in the world, I'm driving or whatever, and those songs come on the radio, automatically everywhere my neck stands up. I feel my heart starting to, to take pace. Um, and that's going to be with me for the rest of my life. You know, hearing those particular tunes, it will always have a very strong effect on me. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that again in a couple of short days time to uh, to hear to hear that song. And Connor usually starts his kind of self-talk, you know, uh, sing it to me, Sinead, let's go. We're going to go to war here. And it's it's just very exciting. He says we're getting a masterpiece. Talk me through that masterpiece. How does it play out, USC 257? Well, to to mention the fight you talk is, is your favorite fight. I think that's I think that's a bit of a preview to what we're going to see. I, 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 I can see it being similar. I think there's a number of guys right now in that weight class, whether it's Eddie, Dustin, Tony, Hooker, all of those guys to me are, are, are if you had them in a tournament, depending on which day it fell, a different guy would win. I feel they're all of a very similar um, ability level. And um, they all, you know, when they face each other, they have these wars. And then Connor faced one of them in Eddie. And it looked, you know, I, I love Eddie, great fighter, great warrior, but he looked like he hadn't really trained. It, it was so one sided. And I have a feeling this one is not going to look very different than that. Can't wait for it. January 23rd goes down. BT Sport box office coming join us for USC 257. The rematch, Poirier versus McGregor. John, thank you so much for your time. I know you've given up quite a bit of your afternoon there to go through some of, some of those iconic moments. Hopefully we took you on a little bit of a trip down memory lane as well and re remembered some sensational moments that you've given the mixed martial arts world. And hopefully there's many, many more to come over the next couple of years, mate. Thank you very much for your time, pal. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much.